Thanks a lot. And uh, indeed, thanks a lot to the organizer for letting me stay in this amazing place. It's great to have summer during winter, but okay. Um, I'm going to talk about indeed uh, diffusion and super diffusion, although the original title was mostly about uh, super diffusion, but there will be a lot also about diffusion. And in a sense, it will be some kind of continuation of uh, all you heard about uh, all generalized aerodynamics and somehow extracting a dynamic picture from, uh, from uh, lattice quantum systems uh, using integrability mostly. <laughs> So, but, any, but anyway, the main focus uh, will be on uh, transport theory. And it did, uh, I guess all of you understand that transport is basically understanding what's the, the current the flow between two, two systems, for example, a different chemical potential, a different bias. And uh, usually you want to introduce some kind of current that depends on frequency, how you drive your system. And usually current is proportional to the bias. And the proportionality constant is the conductivity, sigma, right? And uh, here, are we mostly interested in the limit of zero frequency, so in this uh, direct transport? And uh, what can you say that uh, conductivity at small frequency can uh, sometimes have a, a divergent part, like a delta of omega, and this coefficient, indeed, this called uh, Drude weight that you already heard uh, this week, uh, that somehow measure the fraction of a current that doesn't get dissipated in your system in case you have symmetry or maybe a condensate. And there, are, there is a correction, which is the real uh, conductivity, what you are observing in typical material, which is the DC conductivity, regular part of the conductivity. And uh, so, indeed, since this talk will also be uh, also about uh, integrable models, um, the, I think integrable systems, of course, are, a speci are special in a sense, because, for example, from the point of view of transport, they display some kind of uh, uh, peculiar property. For example, the Drude weight in integrable system, integral lattice system, is, is finite, uh, generically. You have ballistic transport, or, or a fraction of a current is ballistic. In generic system, you expect the Drude weight to be zero if you don't have uh, other mechanism at place, but a finite DC conductivity. Why? Because you still have diffusive transport in your system. And of course, you can think that integrable and generic are two separate words, that you should not uh, mix them, but although they have indeed specific properties in integrable system, a specific property, they still can overlap. So you can still use integrable system to understand properties of generic lattice system. For example, they also, in case of interaction, they also have a finite DC conductivity that uh, you can understand and compute, hoping that maybe you can understand also something about generic interacting systems. Example, the most common and uh, known uh, integrable interacting system that is the XZ chain, which is a celebrated chain, uh, firstly solved by beta in the case of delta equal one. Um, but if you put yourself a delta larger than one uh, and you are a finite temperature, for example, infinite, you will see that, and you look and you study spin transports, you will see that this chain display diffusive transport, complete, purely diffusive, despite the fact that it's integrable. And indeed, integrability is, uh, is hidden in the fact that energy will be ballistic. But spin, at least, is, uh, is uh, diffusive, and you can see it from nice numerical results like this one from. Ljubljana group. And um, so, since the model is integrable, you may ask yourself, let's compute the diffusion constant. Let's uh, use Kubo, uh, Kubo Mori formula to like current current correlation, and let's compute this uh, diffusion constant to see how it depends, for example, on temperature or, or other parameters. But this actually was an open question up to last year because so, uh, the problem is actually not very easy, even if the model is integrable. That's why, indeed, integrability or exactly solvability doesn't really means much because from going to here to some object like uh, current, current correlator is not an easy step. But what you actually have to do, um, of course the system is integrable, there are many concerned quantities, but we only look at the local and quasi-local concerned quantity, namely wherever you can introduce some kind of density of concerned quantity, right? So my QI and our density of concerned quantity, so I can introduce a susceptibility matrix, which is the matrix but basically I integrate the static susceptibility to the charge. This is an important object that uh, enters your hydrodynamic picture. And your aim is to compute the DC matrix, which is indeed the current current for any i and j uh, in your system integrated over x and t. This measure indeed uh, how much uh, of your current gets dissipated through the system 
Of course, if your system allows for a ballistic transport, you should subtract indeed the, through the weight because otherwise this integral will be divergent. But this is, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's this uh, C that I put here. Anyway, I want to compute this uh, correlator and where do I want to compute it? I wanted to compute it on a stationary state, for example, on a finite temperature state. Well, now, a great advantage of integrable system is that I can, uh, as you heard from Benjamin class, uh, and uh, Herbert also, that you can write uh, stationary states in terms of a certain quasi-particle content. Namely, there is a well, it's well defined as the, the idea that you can extract a certain quasi-particle parameterized by a quasi-momentum theta, and each stationary state, tem finite temperature or GGE state, is parameterized by some distribution of quasi-particle rho theta, rho particle theta. So basically, I want to compute what's the current current correlation in a state fully specified by a certain distribution, unspecified distribution of quasi-particle content. To do that, I uh, use brute force approach, namely I just introduce a resolution identity and a sum over excitations. But of course, uh, this is a very complicated problem because excitations can be exponentially, well, in general there are exponential number of excitations you can construct on, on top of a generic uh, state we, and by the way, we are in the thermodynamic limit, so in a sense you have a huge number of excitations. But we will classify them as uh, uh, the relevant excitation from the point of view of local operators, we will classi classify them as uh, particle hole excitations. Basically, um, J is the, the current, the current associated to a local charge is also a local operator. So it cannot really rearrange completely the distribution of quasi-particle in your stationary state. All it can do is to do a small local perturbation to your state. This local perturbation are basically events where certain quasi-particles get uh, scattered and change completely their momentum. And indeed, you, from whole, you get a particle. And uh, you can order the, uh, some kind of the hierarchy of this excitation by specifying the number of a particle hole that you can have your system. Like one or two or three and so on. For each of them, there will be uh, momentum associated to the hole, momentum associated to the particle. And of course, this sum will be infinite. Will be infinite, and uh, we can write it like this. We can basically sum over all the number of particle hole excitations that you can create, that, that your operator can create, and for an interacting system, this can be any infinite. You have to integrate over all the position of particle in momentum space of particle a hole, and of course, this will be weighted by the phase. Maybe a particle hole will have a given momentum and energy. Of course, this momentum energy will be non-trivial functional, not just of the momentum particle hole, but also of the state, of your reference state. And this object will be what are called form factors, namely the scattering amplitude associated to the, to the fact that your operator can create a certain number of excitations. But remember that we are in the thermodynamic limit, so basically we are looking, there is an infinite number of quasi-particles, and we are looking at scattering events, but inside this, uh, this bed of all the other quasi-particles. Like it's a, it's a like a background that somehow you should expect that that's also renormalize the, the amplitude of the scattering event. So these objects are indeed called the finite density form factors, and, um, and these basically were the bottleneck of the computation up to indeed uh, last a few years ago, because no one knew how to compute. This, uh, uh, how to access this, uh, for these objects that are supposed to be very complicated. Even if you have an integrable structure that somehow can give you uh, matrix elements analytically at finite, for finite number of particles, it's very hard to extract the finite density, the thermal limit of this object. Anyway, so uh, we did not compute all these objects because they're very complicated, but we extracted some relevant properties of them, like for example, their, their poles, there are analytic properties in the complex plane of this, uh, of this object, and this somehow was enough to compute what we wanted. And instead, of, I skip all the calculation and I just tell you the results, because I find the results quite nice. And basically, in this sum, you can organize this excitation in terms of one particle hole or two particle hole and so on. And turn out that the one particle hole, you can see them as events where basically quasi particles are traveling through the system and due to the presence of a background, at some point scatter, and they just get modified momentum. 
But this you can really see it's like the green function of your system. And if this is finite, a large time, it means that you have a root weight. And indeed, it turns out that all you need to compute root weight is, the pres is if the presence of one particle of excitation in your, st in your system. Stable, of course, but we are stable because they're integrable. Instead, the two particle excitations are indeed describing the process of scattering between, for example, two quasi particles from the, their hole to the particle momentum. And this completely fix your diffusion constant in your system. So basically, one particle describes the fact that the system has ballistic transport, and they are present indeed also in free, in free system, like free fermion system. But two particles that is that's only present in interaction, in presence of interaction, completely fix the diffusion constant of your system. And higher particle will only uh, in, uh, describe uh, higher processes, but from the point of view of diffusion, all you need is two body scattering. So we found a result. From this result uh, of this matrix, you can extract uh, a kernel, because of course the, this, this matrix, it's uh, in the space of conserved quantities, but conserved quantities can be mapped to quasi-particle via functions that are known. So you can extract some kind of a kernel in a quasi-particle space. And uh, it's nice because this kernel now, theta alpha like quasi-particle, it's, it's as the form of a Markov matrix. Basically, the, the, this diffusion kernel just describe Markov process of quasi-particle exchanging randomly their momenta. And it can be expressed all in terms of the distribution of quasi-particle, their Fermi occupation that is divided by the total density of state, and the, what I call T, which is the scattering shift. And this is something that you already seen from the lesson. That you have the, with down this quasi-particle scatter, there is always a, a finite phase shift, right? And this phase shift depends on theta and alpha, and generically. And this entered directly, that your expression for the diffusion matrix, but it's renormalized. It's, uh, there is this uh, effectivization, if you want, due to the fact that this quasi-particle scatter in the presence on a finite background. And what is also nice is that I can choose the scattering shift I want. I can choose the log to get the TODA, for example, but the most, <coughs> the most simple scattering shift, just minus A, the constant, which describe the models of hard rod gases, where A is basically the size of the rod. And for these models, it was already known what was the diffusion scattering of the system, and indeed, you can find it in the, in the book, of Herbert uh, Spohn, but also some, it was, I think, known since the 70s. <clears throat> and uh, if you plug this definition of scattering shift in this kernel, you find the result that was known since decades. So somehow, again, a confirmation of the fact that uh, integrable quantum systems at large scales behaves like, uh, like a system of hard rods and also diffuse, now disperse their uh, momenta also similarly to hard rods, with some difference due to the fact that these are fermions, and indeed the statistic entered this, this uh, diffusion kernel. But okay, um, another way, so we were kind of lucky that uh, only two particle hole are necessary to uh, compute your diffusion constants, because of course, if you had to sum fully this sum, you have no idea how to, how to do this sum in general, and uh, so one can ask why, uh, in a sense, uh, integrable but also hard rod system all share the same similar structure for these uh, diffusion operators. And uh, we kind of gave an answer recently together with Marco Medeniak and uh, Takato Yoshimura, and Marco indeed talked about this last week for the people that were here. That there is basically um, an extension of the so-called hydrodynamic projection. And I think uh, Benjamin also will talk about this next week. Basically, you can project your current operator on the space of concert quantities. At the first order, basically you get like the, really the projection of the current on the concert quantities that you have, and this is gonna give you, indeed, the root weights. And this, if you want, is like the one particle excitation system. But you can also project it on the uh, square of the, of the concert quantities, like qi, qj, where uh, products of concert quantities, like quadratic fluctuations. Well, it turned out that if you take this term and you plug it in your definition of uh, like Kubo-like um, diffusion constant, you exactly get the diffusion constant. So another confirmation that in these uh, in kind of systems, diffusion is all due to the fact that our quadratic fluctuation of your currents in your system. 
Now, in a generic system, in principle, you could also have extra terms. And this extra term can come, for example, for conserved quantities that are not uh, local, that are not extensive, but they can be quadratically extensive. This has been addressed in detail in a paper of Tomash, where you can show that in generic system, you don't have local quantity, but you can still bound diffusion from this extra content. In generically, this will be a lower bound for diffusion constant in systems. But okay, you can use form factors, you can use uh, hydrodynamic projection, uh, you can use also semi-classical uh, methods uh, by Roman Vassar and Sarangola Gopalakrishna uh, to all find um, basically an expression for your DC matrix. Once you have it, you can indeed extract the quasi-particle kernel simply by the fact that the diffusion matrix will be a bilinear form in the quasi-particle uh, charges, in the charges, if you want. And once you have this uh, kernel, you can plug it in your uh, GHD equation. Somebody was asking, what, what about the Navier-Stokes correction to GHD equation? And it, indeed, this will it. In a sense, this is the, the question that you have seen uh, maybe too many times this week. But this will be the correction due to the fact that indeed there is a non-trivial scattering between quasi-particles that contribute to have a diffusive and dispersive effect. And you can use it to, to indeed model a, a, a theoretically non-equilibrium situation in a generic quantum and classical integral system. <clears throat> but uh, I will now focus mostly on uh, one diffusion constant because of course this is an integrable system. There are many diffusion constants, but I don't care about the diffusion cost of charges that I can't me even measure, but let's look at something that I can measure in, for example, in an experiment or in a numerical simulation. For example, the spin diffusion constant. I started by saying I want to compute the spin diffusion constant. Finally, after extracting this diffusion kernel, we're finally to express the spin diffusion constant, for example, in the XZ spin chain as a very nice and compact formula. It will be basically an integral over all quasi-particle content and Quasi-particle, I will show later, can also be different species because there are different bound states, quasi-particles. And it's all expressed in terms of the occupation, Fermi occupation number of this quasi-particle. This can be like thermal occupation number. Their effective velocity of this quasi-particle and the effective displacement that they have whenever they scatter. And this completely gives the spin diffusion constant. It's a formula I can evaluate, for example, at infinite temperature as a function of delta and gives me this uh, black line curve, okay? Of course, then uh, uh, I want to see if I did everything correct and I want to compare with uh, some TDMRG simulation, for example, the best state-of-the-art numerical technique that we have. And uh, these are the data by Christoph Karash that has uh, so far the best data. The system, you see that the, the red dots are uh, substantially lower than the analytical prediction and this is, uh, well, this is basically uh, because we are still not able to compute, to eff efficiently simulate quantum systems at large times. The TDMRG has the problem that as you simulate entanglement entropy grows, therefore you have to truncate the, the, the time evolution up to a maximal time, which means that when you compute your uh, current current correlator and integrate over time, you are only integrating between zero and at maximal time. And uh, luckily at infinite temperature, this correlator is positive, so basically the TDMRG only gives a lower bound to diffusion. If you try to extrapolate the, the result by using some fitting, like one of a square root T fitting, you get a much better agreement. But okay, one of the reasons indeed that somehow motivates to compute diffusion constant in interactive system is also because we don't actually know how to do it for generic system with numerical techniques. So that's why the importance of having a, an analytical exact result for an interacting system for a diffusion constant. It's this formula, yes. You can evaluate uh, numerically. I mean, this is an analytical formula that you can evaluate numerically. From, because uh, you just have to give the, the input, which is the temperature, for example. But the infinite temperature is nice because you can express this function analytically, but for finite temperature, you will have to do everything numerically, but you can do it. No, you don't need to run the dynamics, but the, the TDMRG run the dynamics, and that's it. 
Okay, <clears throat> but now you will see that this, fig that this figure has a particularity and indeed uh, it goes to a constant, a large delta. This is actually interesting because a large delta, you may say that the model is equivalent to easing, just a classical easing, and, the and you can take that uh, it's a free model. So free model don't have any diffusion. So you would expect that it goes to zero, a large delta, but it turned out that it goes to a constant in a sense because you cannot naively think that the model is free at large delta because it's, not, it's only free in a, at low energy, but the full spectrum remains interactive. It goes to constant. Um, but as you approach delta to one, actually diverge. And from this analytical formula, you can check it diverge as delta minus one, one over square root of delta minus one. And here we enter the whole field of uh, super diffusion in an uh, integrable chain that you already heard uh, also about this week. But let me tell you what, how it diverge. So as I told you, the, the spin diffusion constant, it's the sum over quasi-particle content. Basically, uh, you are summing over the contribution to spin diffusion due to each quasi-particles. So what are the different quasi-particles that you have in this system? Basically, you can think the S equal one quasi-particle as some kind of manion. Of course, it's a manion which is addressed by the presence of other manion, but you can think it like a single spin flip. Um, you can take the extra particle as bound states of this spin flip, right? So you can take like two bound states or two bound states or three. These are bound states that somehow get localized with some exponential tail. Uh, they're a quasi-local object in a sense. And you have to sum over all these bound states and the number of them goes to infinite size. But of course you expect that as larger and larger bound states get, the contribution to diffusion becomes smaller, right? But uh, this is what happens when you are in the regime delta larger than one, and indeed because the velocity of these large bound states basically decay exponentially, as you expect, as the bound states is uh, thicker and thicker, basically is moving slower and slower. But when you are exactly at the isotropic point, their velocity decay polynomially with the size of the bound states. And since the displacement that they also have when the scatter also grows, with the size, as you can expect, because whenever they, they hit them, somebody else, they have to displace their full, uh, their full uh, length. So this displacement grows with the size, actually with the square. Basically, all this polynomial and the occupation, of course, decrease. In a thermal state, you will have less and less of these large bound states, but still not enough to cancel the effect of the displacement that grow. So basically, the contribution to diffusion of large bound states is constant. And you can see analytically from this formula. And therefore, you are summing over S from one to infinity, something that becomes constant. Therefore, you have a, a divergence. And uh, this actually can be also used to extract uh, the dynamical exponent in time of the divergence of the diffusion cause that was done by Mavasar Estarang, where they uh, expressed um, the, the growth as t to the one third. And indeed, what is nowadays well established is that for delta bigger than one, the chain is purely diffusion. It shows normal diffusion, namely dynamical structure factor decay as t to the minus one half. But for delta equal one, it decays at t to minus two third, and it seems to show KPZ universality class. I mean, the dynamical structure factor seems to be in the KPZ universality class. And <clears throat> indeed, there are well established numerical results, very good, also from this year. And some theoretical arguments, one of them indeed using uh, this divergence of quasi-particle, one of them you heard a few years ago, a few hours ago by Veer, and also using the, the structure, the, the, the way how this the diffusion constant diverge, we were also able to uh, basically extract the fact that um, since the diffusion constant basically a large S uh, converge, you can think this uh, from the fact that these large bound states, basically, they still, they have like some term of self-interaction. The, self, the term of self-interaction can be taught as some kind of non-linearity that is present in the system that leads to uh, KPZ universality class. <clears throat> but okay, um, actually we run the program on uh, many other integrable chains where we have uh, access to now to the spin diffusion constant, and we saw that there is super diffusion indeed in SU2 spin chains, but oh, not, no matter what the spin actually, uh, this is just spin one half, but for any integrable finite S spin uh, SU2 chain, you will always see super diffusion with the exponent one third. 
also in SU3, also in Hubbard. So Hubbard model, adult filling, does not display uh, normal diffusion, but display super diffusion. <clears throat> and also in the integrable to, to uh, TJ model. So as I was mentioned this morning, basically there seems that there is a large class of uh, lattice integrable chains that uh, whenever there are there, if you want at the particle hole symmetric point, what does it mean? Like zero field or half filling at all these points, basically the ballistic channel is killed. There is no Drude. And the only channel that is open is a, a super diffusive channel. Basically, all this model seems to belong purely to the KPZ universality class. And we cannot really say what is the thing in common of this class besides the fact that they all seem indeed to have, be isotropic and to have non-abelian symmetry. So uh, we also play the game of uh, looking for, uh, we try to go outside integrability. Because the question is, is this mechanism indeed stable or uh, it's actually a common feature of, uh, non -int of genetic chains with uh, non-abelian symmetry? So the first step was to go to uh, spin one isomer, or if you want, uh, spin S antiferromagnetic spin chains. For this type uh, of chains, Aldein told us that the low energy effective theory is given by the nonlinear sigma model, with or without the topological term. <clears throat> Now, this model is a field theory and is actually integrable. So we could run again the same machine and confirm that even for a field theory, like the linear scale model, at all filling, at zero field, you have zero Drude and the spin diffusion constant that again grows with the exponent one third, signaling again KPZ universality class. Actually, this was interesting because it was op uh, opposite to previous uh, studies. There's a well, well established result from uh, so called semi classical approximation by Subir Sajdev and uh, Kellan Damle. In the end of the 90s, they developed uh, a theory which indeed uh, basically uh, with the aim of computing diffusion constants in uh, strongly interacting spin chains. <clears throat> and they were basically approximating the scattering matrix of the emergent quasi particle to minus one, so assuming like fermionic scattering matrix. But they were predicting, so a low temperature for this system, they were predicting a diffusion constant which is finite. Now, interesting, we can use our formula, take the low temperature limit, and, in the, and fix two different regimes. So the regimes where the external field that you, have to, that you add to your chain is uh, somehow, uh, the ratio between the field and the temperature is larger than one, namely, you are taking zero temperature but with a fixed external field. In this regime, such that W were perfectly correct and our formula completely reproduced the semi-classical approximation for diffusion that they found. But if you take this limit with the field which is much less than the temperature, like zero, then semi-classical approximation breakdown and the correct diffusion constant is actually similar to the one that Sajid Dumble were finding, but divided by one over field, one over H. Namely, signaling the fact that at H equals zero, diffusion constant is actually infinite. This is why, because semi-classical approximation was basically neglecting the contribution to diffusion from the magnetic bound states. Basically, as I told you before, the diffusion constant, it should be a sum over all these different type of excitations, but semi-classical only take the simplest one, S equal one, like the, some kind of lowest line excitation on top of your interacting uh, field theory, but it's not enough. It's not enough, it only gives you one part of the, of the fusion constant, within some regime it's enough, but like zero field is not enough because actually the fusion constant is infinite. So we wanted to check again our prediction, and again we asked to the, one of the best numerics in the, the field, which is again Christoph Karash, uh, to run, uh, to compute the diffusion constant in a spin one antiferromagnetic chain at zero field. Now the problem with YAMRG is that if you try to go to very low temperatures, you have a very long oscillation and you will never see what's going on. So we went to very high temperature, temperature 10, to see what's, what's happening. And this is the simulation for the diffusion constant or the conductivity, but the two are proportional, for the spin one half chain, where we know indeed that diffusion constant grows as t to the one third, and indeed you see the numerics nicely, uh, nicely confirm the growth as t to the one third. 
But then, surprisingly, it ran the same simulation for spin one chain, which is not integrable, which is, we, uh, we only had the prediction for the low temperature because uh, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear um, because the field theory is only valid at low temperature, and we saw the same exact growth as t to the one third. That was a very surprising result because we only thought to see infinite diffusion constant and KPZ scaling at very low temperature, but we actually were finding it again at infinite temperature. And the funny thing is that if you actually add uh, an anisotropy, again, like a delta uh, for your z direction, if you, if you prefer your z direction to the other direction, namely you break SU2 symmetry, you restore normal diffusion. You see that diffusion constant grows in time, but eventually plateau to some constant value of large time, while the isotropic case keeps growing. Now you see, Time is not infinite, because what is happening here is that entanglement entropy of your simulation has grown too much. In order to continue your simulation, you would need to use too much memory, so you have to stop the simulation here. There was, uh, so this uh, was a bit controversial statement. Um, a few months ago, there was a paper by uh, uh, Joël Moore and Maxime Dupont. Uh, basically, they also ran uh, DMRG uh, simulations for uh, this class of, uh, of chains. So basically Eisenberg chain, but different spin. And uh, so spin one half, one, three half, two. And uh, for the spin one half, they confirm super diffusive scaling. This is infinite temperature, infinite temperature as we did mostly, more or less. But for the um, for chain of uh, spin one, uh, or three half, or two, basically what they were seeing is some kind of a slow, crossover from uh, the, the scaling 3 over 2 to the scaling 2, which is diffusion. Now, um, this is, you have to read this, basically, they were they are plotting here the dynamical exponent. So when I say uh, that conductivity grows as t to the one third, it means that uh, the dynamic exponent is 3 over 2. There is always this uh, the writing of dynamic exponents. And when uh, Finite conductivity means diffusion, which means dynamic exponent two, right? Which means that correlation decay as one over t to the minus to the one half. But basically, they, they were saying this kind of crossover from diffusion to, from super diffusion to diffusion, if by pushing the simulation to very large time. Now, this is in principle something that you are not allowed to do. Uh, the, um, basically, you are uh, you know, when you run MPS simulations. You are, uh, your bond dimension has to grow linearly in time. At some point, basically what you can do, you truncate this growth, but you keep the simulation going. Then you are making an error, and this error is completely uncontrolled. So in this case, they did it, and of course they went well beyond uh, the time where the entropy is uh, of the size of the universe. <clears throat> but uh, still, they got something which physically seems reasonable. This is a kind of a mystery. It's hard to say if it's a feature of the numerical method or if there is really some physical crossover from super diffusive to diffusion. Anyway, the, the question is open so far. And uh, just to, and to conclude, so I just want to repeat the fact that integrable chains, despite they are integrable and somehow simpler, or if you want, than generic system, they still display diffusive dynamics. And this is caused by two body scattering events between quasi-particles, or if you want, by quadratic fluctuation of concert quantities, um, which is something that doesn't happen in free systems. Then, super diffusive transport, namely divergence of the diffusion constant, uh, seems to be a feature of isotropic chains. And now it's well established that this will always be there for a class of isotropic integrable chain, namely will persist at all times, but for the non-integrable, <clears throat> there are questions. So can we find the non-integrable chains that also display superdiffusion in the class of KPZ? Maybe these are the Aldane chain, for example, but maybe there are more complicated chains. But still, okay, there have been some attempts. Vir indeed uh, gave a talk uh, this morning why there is KPZ dynamics in a deterministic system which has integrability, so can we understand KPZ dynamics from uh, the well-celebrated theory of nonlinear fluctuating dynamics? This is uh, still open. And uh, if there is really a crossover from uh, KPZ dynamics to diffusive in the non-integrable case, can we understand this? Is this due to uh, 
quasi conserved quantities because maybe KPZ is, is caused by integrability? Or is this uh, some different mechanism that we can understand? And um, it's quite, so in a sense, uh, in classical physics, uh, with nonlinear fluctuated dynamics, it's well understood that you can get KPZ dynamics also in non-integrable system, but in quantum physics is much more subtle. So, and now, so far it's not clear if uh, KPZ fluctuation are basically require, require integrability or not. <clears throat> okay, I'm just in time, so we thank you for attention. Questions or remarks? Uh, so in the case of uh, non-integrable uh, systems, so uh, so what is the argument? Why do you think application of fluctuating hydrodynamics to quantum systems is uh, uh, subtle? Uh, so so we looked at uh, some example of uh, some one of like direct inferments like perturbed Platinger liquid, and there I'm pretty sure that it works. But in but in general, yeah. So what uh, what would prevent uh, from applying it to a quantum system? Yeah, so um, I should have said non-integrable chains, right? Because that's where it's trickier. Basically, in quantum chains, you don't have any generic quantum chain. You, have no, you don't have any ballistic modes. Now, one require of, uh, of non-integrable dynamics is that you have at least one ballistic mode. You, you need to have some finite uh, current in, a, in some... You have to be able to construct some stationary state with a finite current. And then you can expand this current at the quadratic order and... Well, you have, you have, if you want here, you have spin and energy, but this is not enough to have a ballistic mode. Huh? Perfectly adequate to have a ballistic mode with speed zero. I mean, this can happen, right? The... Oh, I mean, it's a... Uh... Speed zero for every state. Yeah, and basically, you, can your a matrix, then you, you don't need to have, have a finite A matrix, and usually A matrix is zero at least naively, then of course... Uh, yes, but suppose you had two conserved quantities, both of which propagate with zero speed and fluctuate independently. I mean, then you would have two diffusively fluctuating modes which you could describe with nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, even though there isn't ballistic transport in the system. So just, I don't think it's sufficient to say that you can't have ballistic... Uh, no, no, but the point is that uh, the way how you, you... I mean, okay... Uh, yeah, I'm not the expert here, yeah, of course, but the way you, you understand uh, KPZ dynamics and nonlinear fluctuator dynamics is by going to the quadratic order in your expression of currents for your system. Now, if already your A matrix, namely the linear part of your current, is zero in any stationary state, you really don't know how to derive this quadratic part. Of course, okay, there are ways maybe to go around this problem, but uh, genetically, I also know that Herbert tried, but... So this is just a comment. I mean, so I think like the, for the isotropic uh, classical spin chain, I mean, there are, uh, which are non-integrable non case. I mean, the studies, I think, starting from the 90s where the similar thing, like at short times, it looks like t to the power two-third, and eventually it goes to a diffusive. Yes, there is a nice paper. I mean, the most recent paper is uh, ended from somebody from Bang uh, Bangalore or... Uh, um, um, indeed, it seems he, see, he, he observed some very slow crossover from uh, super diffusion to diffusion. Yeah, so indeed, now we are, uh, we are trying to understand this indeed using classical. Of course, this is for classical chains. I mean, you still have to believe that there is uh, some quantum class. Since you see the same thing, right? Well, this numerical simulation yeah. that has to be taken with, uh, with uh, particular attention seems indeed to see this kind of diffusion, this kind of crossover. But again. Some other question? No? OK, so thanks a lot. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just about this uh, last thing, 
So it seems to work very well for S equals one half, even though they go much beyond they should. Is that uh, what's uh, happening? Well, okay, yes, seems to work. I mean, in a sense, the spin one uh, simulation is, has the same fluctuation as the spin one half. Yeah. But yes, I mean, uh, this is actually a big mystery in uh, also in tensor network. I mean, it seems that the integrable chains can be simulated much more efficiently than non-integrable chains. And this is probably has to do with the early findings uh, also, Tomas, of, uh, of um, operator spreading in, in integrable chains. But okay. So thanks a lot. And I think thanks to every speaker of this week, right? So the, okay, so.